been a lot of consoles over the years. Many, many consoles. Some good, some bad. And I decided to put down my personal top 10 list of the best consoles that have ever graced our televisions. Now when it comes down to defining the consoles themselves, there's many factors that I'm going to consider. Things like innovation, market impact, and quality of games are going to weigh heavy on the decision. That's why you won't see the Sega Genesis or Super Nintendo here, and I'll explain why they're absent when we hit number 9 on the list. This was a very hard list to put together because there were so many consoles to go through, but before I get into the actual list, I have some runners up. And these are listed from... I guess you could say okay to good because these are not bad systems. Number 4, the Atari 2600. Well, this is the system that got everyone interested in video games as it claimed to offer arcade quality games. It didn't. It did, however, contribute to the video game crash of 1983 to 1985. Due to the lack of quality games and most of it being shovelware that people who had no business making games were trying to cash in on the video game craze. Even dog food companies made video games. I'm not joking, Google it, chase the chuck wagon. Number 3, the Neo Geo AES. Neo Geo was one of the kings of the arcade. They decided to get into the console race with their own 24-bit system. It was just the arcade hardware crammed into a black plastic box, and it was a really good system, but there were three problems. It was extremely rare to find, cost $650, and each cartridge cost $300. Yeah, it was destined to fail. Number 2, the N64. Now I know what you're thinking, how dare I put the Nintendo 64 as a runner-up. The N64 is a great system and had some great games, don't get me wrong, but I'm putting it on the runner-up list because it came out during a very important time. This is where we transitioned from cartridges to CDs. If Nintendo went with CDs instead, it's possible that they could have killed the PlayStation. Thankfully it didn't, but Nintendo started to rely more on gimmicks later on, which brings me to the number one runner-up. And the number one runner-up is the Wii U. I love the Wii U. I want one, but I don't have the money. I'll play it whenever I get a chance, but to me, it's like the Wii on steroids with a touchscreen. And with the way Nintendo is handling the hardware for their home system, it's not just a problem for Nintendo, but it's a problem for the gaming industry and gamers alike, and I'll explain that when I hit number 8 on the main list. It also had a pretty rough launch with systems getting bricked from updates going wrong or the touchscreen controllers breaking after a short period of time. Alright, on to the main list. This should prove interesting. Number 10, the Magnavox Odyssey. The Magnavox Odyssey was released in 1972 and was the first home video game console that was created by Ralph Baer who is often credited as the father of video games. He thought that people should be able to do more with their television sets than just watch TV. The system came with overlays that you'd put on the TV screen, and there were cartridges. However, there was no game data on the cartridge. All of the games were programmed into the system, and what the cartridges did was that they told the system what game to run. While the system was marketed horribly, it was the one that got everything started, and number 9 on the list is the one that saved everything. Number 9, the Nintendo Entertainment System. While Nintendo made a few systems before the NES or Famicom as it was known in Japan, this was the system that pulled the American video game market out of the video game crash, which really only affected America because it was marketed not as a video game system, but as a robot toy control system. The NES did have its fair share of bad games, although most of them were just unlicensed junk. Nintendo set up guidelines to prevent another video game crash, like a lockout chip or limiting how many games a company could release within a year but it did give us iconic games like Metroid, Legend of Zelda, and Super Mario Bros. Now the reason why I'm not including the Sega Genesis or Super Nintendo on the list is because they were really just the next step up. They offered better graphics and sound, but were still cartridge based. And the games, while great, were also the next step up from what the NES had. And while they were great and fun systems, I feel like there really wasn't any true innovation in them. And the NES made a return as an emulator on number 8 on this list. Number 8, the Nintendo Wii. Ah, the Wii, the epitome of gimmicky game systems. While Sony and Microsoft wanted to bring in next-generation hardware, Nintendo decided to take an alternate route and give us next-generation controls. Unfortunately, this is where Nintendo decided that they no longer wanted to compete. When it comes to hardware, the Wii is really just a GameCube that hit the gym a few times a month. The motion controls are impressive when developers decide to use them. I feel that Metroid Prime 3 was really the only game to push the system to its limits. And because Nintendo decided not to compete in hardware, it really screwed over developers because they were no longer able to port things over easily, if at all. The Wii, while it had great games, it had more shovelware when compared to the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360, especially when you look at the comparison of games on the consoles. Hey, I'm gonna toss this unfinished prototype onto that GameCube with waggle stick controls. We might be able to snag a few bucks for it. 
No one takes the Wii all that seriously except for Nintendo and their fans. Developers want powerful hardware so they can do more with games, and while third-party developers want to develop for the Wii, they really couldn't do all that they wanted as they were limited by the console's hardware. The Wii was an amazing piece of innovation, but, and this is my opinion, Sony and Microsoft beat them with the PlayStation Move and Kinect. And with this being Nintendo's first console that can go online, they haven't gotten online right at all. Even with the Wii U, it's still not as good as Xbox Live or the PlayStation Network in the way that it's being handled. I really do wish that Nintendo would put on their big boy pants and make something that could compete directly with Microsoft and Sony. Number 7, the Sony PlayStation. We know how this story goes. Nintendo wanted to make a system that used CDs, so they partnered with Sony who would build the system, but Nintendo backed out because they couldn't come to an agreement. Sony was pissed because Nintendo backed out after they put all that work into making the system, so they decided to release it on their own. They curb stomped the Sega Saturn and stole the third party developers. Saying that the Sony PlayStation is a success is like saying the Atlantic Ocean is damn. The PlayStation was a success over the Saturn because it was easy to develop for. And from what I've read, the Saturn, while a much more powerful system than the PlayStation, was an absolute nightmare to develop for. And Sony welcomed third-party developers with open arms as the PlayStation was the easiest to make games for at the time. The PlayStation was just marketing genius at its best. Imagine the success of the Atari 2600 at its peak. That was the PlayStation. Everyone had to get in on it. Even though Sony slaughtered the Saturn, that didn't stop Sega from making one last console. Number 6, the Dreamcast. The last system Sega would ever make before becoming a third-party developer. This is a system that gave us some really good games and nice hardware. It was also the first system to advertise being able to play online with your friends, because of the built-in modem. While the Saturn, and yes, even the Sega Genesis were capable of going online, it wasn't an advertised feature and required a special modem cartridge. The Dreamcast is considered by many to be way ahead of its time, however, it was a very pivotal system in gaming history. While the Dreamcast only lived for two short years, it paved the way for services that we know now as the PlayStation Network and Xbox Live. This was extremely innovative for its time, and games like Jet Set Radio made cell shaded graphics popular. Then there was the VMU. While it really wasn't used, it was a very innovative feature. In fact, I still have a Dreamcast, autographed by Yuji Naka when he was still part of Sonic Team. This system has never been turned on. Number 5, the Nintendo GameCube. The GameCube will always hold a special place in my heart. Not only was this my favorite Nintendo system, but I think that this was the best system Nintendo has ever made. It had some of the greatest games on it that carried the Nintendo name, like Metroid Prime, F-Zero GX, Legend of Zelda, The Wind Waker. And I don't care what anyone says, I loved Star Fox Adventures and Super Mario Sunshine. In fact, a lot of my favorite Nintendo games are on the GameCube. And let's not forget such memorable games like Billy Hatcher and, of course, Eternal Darkness Sanity's Requiem. They also brought back the Game Boy Player that attached to the bottom of the system, so that way you could play Game Boy Advance games. And there were a lot of fun party games and it was overall a fun system. This was also the system that brought back some third-party developers to Nintendo, allowing them to really compete with Sony and then newcomer to the console race, Microsoft. Unfortunately, after this system, Nintendo just didn't want to compete anymore, so they made the Wii. And while it is a good system, it was pretty much a big middle finger to third-party developers. Number 4, the original Xbox. Like the Dreamcast, the Xbox was also a very innovative system. Microsoft had created something called DirectX, which was used for game programming on Windows platforms back in 1995. Because developers were straying away from PC gaming, Microsoft was losing money due to Sony's PlayStation, so they wanted to compete directly with the upcoming PlayStation 2. What they did is they took some engineers from the DirectX team in 1998 and had them take apart Dell laptops. No, I'm not joking. And they started work on what was going by the name of the Direct Xbox. And now you know where the name Xbox comes from. And the funny thing is, Microsoft's marketing department hated that name. They hated, hated, hated the name Xbox. While the Dreamcast laid the roadwork for online multiplayer, the Xbox took off with the idea and Xbox Live became the domineering name for online multiplayer. And games like Halo shaped modern day shooters and online multiplayer. So all that is good for the market, but looking back on it now, it can be considered bad as well as when you look at modern day shooters now. You can almost feel the Halo influence, and with the extremely heavy focus on online multiplayer, because even if single player mode is really good, the game could get overlooked if the multiplayer isn't good or just non-existent. This is also the first video game system to have a hard drive in it, which was used for saved game data, and was also able to rip music from CDs. When it came down to specifications, it was the most powerful system out of the 6th generation systems. It was all PC hardware. The operating system was based on Windows NT and XP. The processor was an Intel Pentium, and the graphics chip was made by Nvidia. While I was very interested in the original Xbox, I could not justify buying one because there were no games that I wanted for it. Number 3, the PlayStation 3. The PlayStation 3 has a lot of great things, 
Blu-ray, free online service, amazing exclusives, and is the most powerful of the 7th generation systems and would probably be number 2 on the list or at least tied for it if it wasn't for one major thing. The PlayStation 3's launch was a colossal failure of monumental proportions. Even if you're a diehard Sony fan, you have to admit that the PS3 had the roughest launch in gaming history. The PS3 was touted as the system to end all systems, and it tripped and broke its face once it stepped out the door. The cell processor was a huge selling point, although that was just marketing, because if it was really that important, they would not have abandoned cell architecture for an x86-64 architecture-based processor from AMD for the PlayStation 4. Remember what I said about the Neo Geo AES being $650? Well, the PS3 was $600 when it was released, and stores were stocked full of them. No one wanted to buy the system. No one wanted to develop for it because it was expensive to develop for. PC World put the PlayStation 3 at the number 8 spot for its top 21 tech blunders of 2006. It got a ton of negative press and Sony was trying to sell the system on potential to try to get people on their side. And the launch titles for it were the absolute worst in history for the PlayStation systems. And when they removed PS2 backwards compatibility, they claimed it was to reduce the cost of the system. The first generation had actual PS2 hardware in it, but the second generation was done through software emulation. After the second generation of PlayStation 3s, they removed the PlayStation 2 backwards compatibility completely. However, you can now buy PlayStation 2 games digitally off the PlayStation Network. So that really sends the message that they just wanted you to buy your PlayStation 2 games all over again. But despite its very rocky first year and somewhat bumpy second year, things started to look good for Sony and the potential started to pay off. Blu-ray won the format over HD DVDs, which I admit, was a very pivotal turning point, and the system became such a home media center that Microsoft had to do a major overhaul on the 360's operating system just to compete. And because of the terrible launch, probably the worst in gaming history, I cannot in good conscience give the PlayStation 3 any higher than the number 3 spot. Number 2, the Xbox 360. While the original Xbox interested me but didn't offer anything, the 360 had the opposite effect on me. Before the 7th generation systems were released, I kind of just ignored the 360. I was following the PlayStation 3, Nintendo, Wii, DS, and PSP a lot more. I figured that since the original Xbox offered me nothing, why bother with the 360? And then Sony slapped that $600 price tag on the PS3 and I said, uh, let me take a look at that 360 again. I got my 360 four months after launch and a lot of the launch titles were pretty decent so I wasn't regretting my purchase. And more and more games were coming out and I was finding myself very entertained. Microsoft pulled a brilliant move by releasing the system a whole year ahead of Sony and Nintendo to gain more third party support. While the 360 was infamous for the red ring of death, the whole thing was blown way out of proportion. Out of all my friends, only one of them has a 360 that red ringed on them. But Microsoft did address the issue and extended the warranty from 1 to 3 years, and with the new Slim model, they fixed the issues. Or so they say. While the 360 isn't as powerful as the PS3 and doesn't have games like Uncharted or Infamous, it does get more points for actually grabbing my attention and being a console of the 7th generation that I've stuck with the longest. And it's really given the PlayStation 3 a run for its money. And a big plus was the controller for the 360. This has been the most comfortable controller I have ever held. It just feels completely natural so my thumb doesn't cramp up when moving characters on the screen. It was not an easy choice to decide for the number 2 spot between the 360 and the PS3, so pretty much the 360 wins by a hair. And I think my number one console should be obvious. Number one, the PlayStation 2. If there was one system I could choose to play for all of eternity, it would be the PlayStation 2. The PS2 has sold the most systems ever clocking in at 155 million. It's the most successful video game console in history. The PS2 is the system that just did everything right. It used DVDs for its game media and was an out-of-the-box DVD player, unlike the original Xbox where you had to buy a remote control to use its DVD feature. The PlayStation 2 was the renaissance of gaming. This system has some of the greatest games ever made. The Jack series, Ratchet and Clank, Sly Cooper, God of War, Disgaea, Gran Turismo 4, Kingdom Hearts, and I can go on forever. There were so many good games. When people talk about the best PS2 games, they're like top 25 to top 100 lists. That's how many good games there were for this system, and the PS2 lasted for 12 years, because Sony stopped producing them last year. And it was so successful that it stole console exclusives, like Resident Evil 4. That was exclusive to the GameCube, and the PS2 stole it. The sixth generation of consoles had a very clearly defined winner, and it was the PS2 by a landslide. And now that I was finally able to get my hands on a PlayStation 2, I can finally start reviewing games for the system, and I can already guarantee you that I don't have the game you're about to request.